Uh, yeah, thanks for coming on. This is, like I said, episode 18 of this little uh, interview show that we started once quarantine happened. And I didn't know uh -huh. how many of them we do. Uh, and it just, the longer this goes, and our website is down, so I don't have a place to actually print things anymore. So oh. <laughs> I'll just be a talk show host for now. That's fine. It's, why, why is the website down? For reasons that are uh, over my head, truthfully, okay. uh, as the as the not tech guy, it has something to do with WordPress and the fact that the uh, website okay. is so old that uh, current WordPress plugins don't mm, jive with ours. Yeah, and then yeah. the whole thing kind of caved in on itself and right. way uh, above it's a my shame. Head. But yeah, that's familiar, familiar situation to me as well. And there was a guy who was working on it and then he, it's nobody's day job. So it was kind of when mm -hmm. you get around to mm -hmm. it. And so, yeah. So at least I could take pictures at shows and then now there's no shows till who knows when. So, right. right. So we'll pretend to be a talk show host. <laughs> uh, you, you work with what you got. Exactly. It's a weird time. It's a weird it time is. to be doing this kind of thing. How's, uh, how's month six of pandemic treating you so far? Well, you know, I, I think I've, it's not been bad for me. It's been actually, I've, uh, it's been good in quite a few ways. Uh, there were some moments when I thought I was going a bit mad and then it's, you know, it's affected everybody's plans uh, to the point now where I'm not really sure, you know, what it's going to be like when we crawl out from the rubble and uh, uh, try to, you know, I, I know it's not going to be the same as it was before. Uh, but then after, you know, that anxiety is, uh, is noted, uh, you know, you reach a, you keep reaching new levels of equilibrium, and uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't mind a quieter life. Yeah. In fact, I kind of enjoy it. I'm a, yeah. I'm a quiet, contemplative kind of person. So, <laughs> right. Spending a lot of time just with my in my own head, I think uh, there, it it suits me pretty well. Uh, but I think in the long term, you would, I you'd have to. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I I just rely on everybody else to keep things going, yeah, and right. then you kind of worry that uh, they won't be able to do that, and I'm not doing my part. I never was really doing m doing much heavy lifting and keeping the world going <laughs> anyway. So uh, that's a little bit worrying, but uh, I I borne up to my own surprise pretty well. That's good. That's good to hear. Um. I'm sort of much the same way. I like the existential piece aside, and I, it's weird to have to teach your 12 year old what the word existential means, but that's mm. kind of where we are right now. Uh, but other, like that part aside, I think we're doing okay, at least in my little yeah. bubble. Yeah, right. It's, it, it depends on, on, it depends on your bubble. <laughs> my, my bubble's a okay, really. So let's, um, Let's talk about the reissues because that's sort of the big, the big deal. And the first one is, I think, yeah. officially finally showing up in people's mailboxes or something, isn't it? Like, right. Yeah. I mean, I know they went out. I got mine, um, <laughs> which is very exciting. I'm just, I'm just like everybody else, you know. They, uh, there's the headquarter. The Sounds Radical headquarters is, uh, is in uh, uh, Baltimore area, and uh, that's where everything goes. And then, you know, I, I, I've been in the the development and planning stages of these things is very takes a long time and it's very involved and very complicated and it's not like it's a surprise to me in one way but in another way it is always kind of a shocking revelation to see you know the concept made flesh so i yeah. got i got the women who love them uh just you know last week uh and it just blew me away how beautiful it was and you, you always have the, I mean, the plan is to make them beautiful objects, yeah. uh, but you never know what's going to go wrong uh, <laughs> and you never know how it's going to be. So it, it's, uh, yeah. And so I got one and I, you know, they're gradually tr trickling in every single thing you do in this time uh, takes a thing, it takes something, you know, that is a bit difficult anyway, and just adds a whole several layers of further difficulty on it you know the the pressings are always delayed because of the pressing plants running at 
at lower capacity and just right. every single step means that it's just a little harder and uh i think you know the post office takes longer to to deliver things etc cetera, etc cetera. uh but uh i was really i was really happy with the result uh which you know that's from that's amazing because it's been 30 years of not being all that uh happy with the results i mean you know the, the, it was it was always a bit everything we did in the past was all uh kind of slapdash and off the seat of your pants and low budget and yeah. uh so it's kind of nice to i mean it's the one chance last chance to try to re reiterate it right and you know it's not like it's uh making anybody lots of money but it is uh quite satisfying to be able to do it finally so um it's great how long did your part of pulling it all together actually take because i know you had been going through tapes and masters and yeah i mean yeah like finding the tapes was hard uh and kind of organizing them and figuring out what they were and knowing where the gaps were so that, that you could try to fill them in because it was a lot of very weird mislabeled and ill and unlabeled tapes and i still there's still things i don't i haven't located but uh so finding them and organizing them and you know taking notes on them everything and getting over it, I mean, it was just so overwhelming mm. uh that i avoided it for a long time and then sort of forensically listening to uh, to them was kind of uh, uh not only time consuming and uh, and challenging but also kind of emotionally weird oh i can uh, imagine yeah both both because of you know it's, it's you think of stuff you did when you were 20 uh years old and you know you're what are you going to do with that and then yeah. you know sometimes it's your sometimes i was pleasantly surprised uh i i never listened to it uh at the time uh beyond you know the initial time it wasn't something i don't know if anybody does this it would be a weird thing to do but i'll put on my own record and yeah, yeah. and uh you know i i never did that so when i had to when i had a reason to uh that was very strange but sometimes i was pleasantly surprised the uh sound that you get direct from the real tape uh is with a full you know the the full spectrum capture of all the information it can be so different from it's certainly the way i remembered it in a lot of cases and from mm. the way that it was released and but you know sometimes hearing with greater clarity reveals some unpleasant things as well so yeah, yeah. uh you know it's it's a it's a weird thing so uh you know then planning what to do with it was also challenging uh although interestingly uh you know treading some familiar ground because we've been working with Chris Applegren uh of you know formerly of Lookout Records yeah. when it existed who did you know all who, we did artwork since 94 it was me and him sort of uh collaborating on on the uh the design part of it and he's a great designer and so I you know it's just like old times in a way just like it's 1995 again we, yeah, yeah. before the before the covid thing happened we were meeting up you know every every few weeks to go over the art the same way and he done some so it's a lot of it is like that uh but it's just a long you plan it you say i want to put this this thing out and then you're looking at a couple of years till it actually comes out and it's stuff that was recorded you know uh decades ago in some cases uh, it's a, it's a strange thing but but still pretty cool did the reissue idea come with pulling mtx forever together or did they sort of coexist the i mean ideas? yeah I, the, the way that i thought of mtx forever was uh, as a dry run you know once mm. we once we finally got our act together and got the tapes transferred which was you know i had initially thought of it very casually in sort of more like a lark you know like ah oh, it would be interesting if we did. and i when i realized the kind of perishable state of affairs then it became more kind of a, an urgent matter and so we that kind of lit a fire under the under the project of just assessing it and getting the transfers made which is a very lot more difficult process and a lot more complicated then i think i real i mean i i certainly realize it now but i it was a i, I was 
had to learn a lot very quickly in the, in the process of this. So we finally got these tapes transferred and I was listening to them trying to figure out what the hell are we going to do with it. And so the MTX forever was a way of, uh, you know, seeing what would happen if we took the tapes from all of these different phases, different formats going back to 1986. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we had at least one song from each of the major releases. So we got to see what could be done with them. And the results were, you know, uh, I was prepared for, I was prepared for the worst um, <laughs> and the results were great. Uh, and we, you know, Justin Perkins uh, is a terrific engineer and uh, you get, you know, we took as much care with it as possible, everyone collectively involved in it. Um, so that was, you know, the first crossing that threshold was, okay, it's successful uh, sonically. Um, and uh, so now that we know, uh, we, we know what happens to, to these various types of recordings, we mm. can get down to, you know, to trying to wrestle with the individual releases. And we're just starting that. I mean, it's a lot, some of that is gonna be more complicated than the, than the compilation, but uh, you know, so far so good. Women Who Love Them came out great and, uh, you know, slowed down a little by the pandemic situation, but we're still going. And the, the goal is to, you know, have a uh, careful reissue of every single, every single thing, the entire catalog, uh, including seven inches. And that sounds, seven inches. yeah, that's it, it's weird, effort. But, yeah, yeah, it's weird, but it's like, it's the chance, it's, it's like, I have this chance to do it. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, if I don't do it, no one's going to do it. And right. then things, things get lost. And uh, maybe it's not the moat. It's not, you know, these, this is not the, it's not the, you know, works of Dostoevsky or uh, any, or, or uh, the clash or anything really important, but in its own little world, it's important enough that if you can do it, you might as well. And so uh, that's the, that's the ethos of it. And it's, it's quite rewarding, even though, a lot of work and you know a lot of challenges yeah i think mr t experience where i mean most bands aren't the clash but if you are of a certain age and let's use my age i'll be 41 next week uh if you are of a certain age and grew up in the quote unquote punk scene if we if we had one in new hampshire where i'm from but you were you investigated the lookout records catalog and so mr t experience was a hugely important band in my little circle anyway but i think mm -hmm. that that's that those circles exist sort of around the country obviously yeah yeah i mean I, and it's uh you know i'm i'm uh, you know all self-deprecation aside it's it is you know it's a it's a small part of history mm -hmm. uh and uh you know the really the the alternative not doing it would mean it would all deteriorate and uh just blow away right. both in terms of the of the actual physical um, you know, masters, but also, you know, in terms of its, I mean, the, everything, uh, it's this irony that we have in this day and age where everything is so easy to store and transfer. And, you know, theoretically, that makes it, that just leaves the whole world open to you. And, uh, and it's just this wonderful thing. But in fact, it means people don't do things very carefully. Yeah. And it all gets kind of mushed up in a big, uh, ill-defined, inconsequential uh, mass, and is forgotten. And uh, you know, the virtual uh, virtual items have uh, they 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 fade and blow away. Yeah. Whereas you have a thing you made that you were trying to, you know, as like I said, make these beautiful objects uh, for you know, if nothing else you can trip over them in your living room sometime. They <laughs> remind you of their existence. Yeah, right. And that's, that's something, because uh, uh, there's uh, the, the alternative is uh, just, uh, you know, a, an insub insubstantial, airy thing that just kind of gets, gets lost in the shuffle. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's an, I've, I've thought a lot about the, I don't know, philosophical implications yeah, of that. Right. Right. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, reiterating things in a, in a interesting way is a, is, is a, is a good way to go. It's better than the alternative and it's, and it's better than nothing. Yeah. 
Can you talk, I, you've talked on a couple of other things. I think it was maybe the Cars Con Carne uh, podcast that he's doing now, but about the sort of lengths you had to go to to actually find some of the tapes. And did I hear correctly that there was one that was like stored in somebody's boot? Or, or they found well, it in that a was boot when I shoe found or? in a boot. Like I was, uh, <laughs> that it, I think my, my best guess is it had been in a, a bag or a box that was a jumble of other, yeah. you know, memorabilia or something. You know, we, I, this wasn't my job to keep track of this stuff. And yeah. I haven't put any, uh, I just by default ended up with, you know, with, with it in, you know, and it's just was completely disorganized. And I remember, so there, I, it was, if I'm not mistaken, I did, I could look at, I could, I could consult my uh, inventory <laughs> notes, but the, uh, it was the women who love them master, which only existed as a dat safety copy. And I, uh, the, that was missing and I had had no luck turning it up. And just by, by accident, uh, it was in a cowboy boot that was in the closet and it just like by accident just kind of uh, uh, fell out. And, you know, that was like, so you have a bunch of junk, you're putting it in a box out on the street with a sign that says free on it. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, you've done that before. I've done that a few sure. times. Who knows how many tapes accidentally wound it up in boots and shoes uh, out in a cardboard box on the street. Um, and, you know, for that's just the stuff that I have. I know there's other stuff because of the, because of the kind of the convoluted history of this archive yeah, yeah. and the fact that some of it is not labeled that well. I'm sure that some of my tapes wound up in other bands equivalent of Dr. Frank and in, in their closet and in their boots. <laughs> and uh, you know, who knows, uh, who knows where they, where they uh, will eventually wind up. Did you own all of the masters to everything? Is that the way it worked through Lookout? Or did you always uh, own them or did you get them back? Um, you know, they, they, when Lookout dissolved, uh, they, as a, as a general policy, returned all the masters mm -hmm. to they, you know, ownership of the masters. I mean, they, the, legally, it's, you know, uh, who pays for the recording is the person who owns the master as a general rule, I think, mm -hmm. in, in the law. And so it's usually the label and that was, a, you know, that was a, they didn't, they weren't trying to, you know, a lot of times when, uh, when labels, when bands, you know, bands fade away and labels uh, kind of go out of business and reconstitute, they will, you know, try to uh, sort of organize themselves so they can sell things off or yeah. and if they can't sell them off, then they just keep them or, destroy them or and that wasn't what chris uh was all about obviously and so yeah we, the, but there was a there was a time when that was determined okay so i own the masters now that's great that's better than not owning the masters but i didn't really understand what that meant yeah uh as i do now and you know i sort of naively thought that even then even when there was no label in existence that there was somewhere where all these masters resided. And if I ever decided I want to do something with, I just pick up the phone and call someone and say, oh, yeah. will you deliver these masters to my, <laughs> uh, to my home? I, right. I require LK 49. And, and that is not how it was. They were, it was a, just a lot of chaos, various different uh, locations. And then all of the, the bulk of what I have and what most bands have, uh, went through a intermediary uh, collection station, which was Jingletown. Uh, well, the, 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 the studio, it used to be Studio 880 that Green Day owned oh, yeah, uh, yeah. in Oakland when they were doing that, when Corbett was uh, doing that movie, the East Bay punk yeah. movie. Yep. And so, you know, it was, I think that was part of their process is just that they just got, and I'm sure Chris, and other anyone else who was involved in storing this stuff that was in various garages and everything was very happy to to shunt it all off to someone else. Yeah, right. And then uh, after that, uh, when it was finished, whatever they did with them, I don't know that they they didn't really end up doing that much. I think they had some they had more ambitious plans for the for the at least the tapes than actually ended up working out. And I just suddenly got a call from Corbett uh, 
saying, okay, we're bringing your tapes over. And I, was, I have a tiny apartment. Uh, there was, it, I was very difficult. It really couldn't fit uh, very easily into it. It brought over, I don't know, 24 bins of tapes. But that was, you know, they went from a big, you know, area of the studio with everybody else's tapes. I mean, yeah, we're talking yeah, right. thousands and thousands, yeah. hundreds of these bins. You know, there some could be like, you know, uh, could have gotten into other people's bins, especially if they're mislabeled. So it was a big mess. And I was so overwhelmed by it that I just, I stacked them against the walls uh, of the apartment and was just too, it was too much to even look at them. And I was, you know, motivated uh, finally when we started discussing the possibility of doing reissues. And, I, and that's when I realized what a daunting task it was. I still thought for a couple of years they were in my apartment and I still had this idea, oh, I'll just draw out this particular tape. And, but it's not that easy. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's been an education. How does, so for somebody who's, uh, I've been a, obviously a music consumer for as, as long as I can remember, but my knowledge of music recording uh, is essentially four guys in a garage hitting record on an old Iowa boombox in the mid 90s, or mm. my Sony little, <laughs> like, yeah. wh what does that process actually entail when you have masters that you're, look, that you're trying to listen to? and then have somebody go through them and piece them together and make them sound the way you want them to. Well, so there's, there's, uh, there's two categories of, uh, of tapes. There's the, there's the multi-track masters, which are mm -hmm. the, where the, what you have running uh, in the studio while you're, you know, you got, you got the drums take up several tracks and you got a guitar and a bass and a guitar and a vocal and other vocals. And, and so there's, there's that. And then there are the two track mix downs that, you take those multi-tracks and you, you know, do whatever levels and effects and EQs and like turn them into a stereo um, tape, two tracks left and right. Mm. And so uh, <clears throat> those are relatively straightforward. The problem is that a lot of the, um, and, and that's all we've dealt with so far. I haven't ventured into the multi-track that's a that's a whole other can of worms there are some of these records that i want is that why you started consider. where you started yeah yeah uh, well there was two uh um it was we started because we knew how to do it with the mm -hmm. with the stereo mixes and yeah. we had a a technician who was able to <clears throat> to do it uh, so that was the mtx forever then we didn't remix anything we just was here are the the uh stereo masters as they existed let's see make the best of it and then women who love them was was a master a stereo master that sounded pretty good as as is and it also had never been released on vinyl so that was a oh, right. that yeah. made it a priority um but uh so the the process the the, the challenge is even with these stereo ones they were in a very variety of formats and they've got to be played on machines that will play them. And yeah. uh, as time goes on, uh, these machines get scarcer and scarcer. I mean, there are, you know, quarter inch reel to reel uh, tape decks out there that, you know, and, and half inch. Uh, and, uh, but some of these were on more obscure formats than these. And also you gotta be careful with the old tapes because they're very, they can be destroyed if they're, not handled properly or if the machine is not in perfect order and it can be the case that the that it can I mean it wasn't the case with any of our tapes as it mm. turns out but it can be the case that you've got, got one shot to play it before it disintegrates like Mission Impossible really? and uh, yeah really you can and I've seen the tapes in bad where you put them on the machine and just like as they're turning if they shed it's like little <laughs> slivers of the tape sort of in a little cloud of dust and yeah. it's like and there's oh stop it and uh the, the the time i saw that was uh that shocked me it was it was um at fantasy and was george horn was doing the mastering of a of an old uh tape and uh he had to stop and uh there's a process that is known as baking which you apply continuous heat to a tape and it it uh 
kind of solidifies its integrity, or at least theoretically it yeah, does. Right. Uh, George Horn used a hairdryer, which just was the most, the craziest thing. He just <laughs> plugged in a hairdryer and, and uh, you know, did it on the table. Oh, that seems good enough. And Seems and, that's uh, not then, standard protocol. <laughs> well, it, you know, it, wor it, it, it worked. It worked yeah, for him at right. the time. You did, you did what you could at the time. But you, so we did had to do it more carefully because this was uh, more, uh, you know, it was more important than yeah. it seemed at the, in those days. So we, the Jessica Thompson, she's an uh, audio uh, ar archival rest restorer kind of. Uh, that's what she does specifically. And she has a method for baking them. And uh, so she did it. And, and none of them were in... Uh, none of the magnetic tapes were in such bad shape that they were destroyed. Um, the problem came, we had some weird, there's a weird uh, digital format in the, that, w that some of this stuff was preserved on because they used to make, they used to use these digital tape cassette, not a DAT, but it, it was, it's a Sony 1630 format that they used to make CDs from. And, oh, okay. um, and the, the, that for, for a lot of this material, that was what, what existed. And those machines in working order are really hard to find. And also digital, uh, you know, in theory it's higher fidelity, but it is, uh, uh not, doesn't have as much integrity and there's dropouts and there's yeah, yeah, yeah. errors and all this stuff. So you have to try to, uh, sometimes you have to try to, uh, there were some cases where we had various formats where you had to take bits from one and add it into another to fill in the gaps and things like that. So it's a sort of a, you know, like a, a archaeological, yeah, uh, right. you know, you see the, the dinosaur, we have most of the bones, but then, right. you know, this, this one is a plaster, it's filled in there, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, really, really interesting uh, process. And but also kind of scary because you know if it if it if something screws up and it's the the sole copy, that's the end. You know, it's crazy. That's daunting. <laughs> that yeah. like it that, yeah. that uh, triggers the anxiety levels to flood. Oh, absolutely. It's it's, it's been really nerve wracking. And then you know, when I <clears throat> uh, there was a a time in the midst of all of this when uh, I had a pipe burst in my apartment and oh, it just no. and it was it I, the entire place was flooded fortunately this building is so wonky that it's kind of crooked yeah, it's yeah, yeah. this yeah. way it's kind of like a batman yep. villain's lair yep. um and so most of the water ended up at, at the, that at that end and but there was this i was sort of moving the guitars and the tapes up to higher ground within the apartment because <laughs> you know that that would really have destroyed them if they had been waterlogged i don't uh uh and, and you know uh, so that i i was lucky uh in that situation but so much can go wrong with such a fragile yeah. uh thing after decades you know some of this stuff is from the 80s and uh it's amazing that it that it survived as well as it as well as it did I know you've chronicled some of this on your uh, regular weekly Songs of Odin uh, mm -hmm. blog, which is, which is fascinating. And I'll put the link, I'll eventually post this on YouTube. So I'll put the link to all of your stuff in there because it's fascinating. I'm, I'm a, a, a dork when it comes to under, like learning about individual songs, how, the, how things were recorded, what references are that. So I find yeah. that fascinating. But for those who haven't read, uh, when you've gone back and re-listened to some of these things and revisited them for the first time in 30 years, did you, uh, do you allow yourself to go, oh, that was pretty good? Or do you find yourself catching, boy, I wish we had done this different. I wish we had done this different. Like, are you yeah, hypercritical I mean, that way? Oh, I definitely am. And I expected to, I ex when, I expe when I started for, you know, listening to it, I expected uh, to find it devoid of value really mm -hmm. you know i mean i hadn't listened to it for you know 10 years when i started the, the process uh and i i was pleasantly surprised by a lot of it um but there's a lot of cringe uh <laughs> in something that you anything that you've done even things that are universally approved of you listen and you'll all you hear is the uh 
all you hear is the, the problems. And of course, there's a there's a even sort of beyond that as a more general kind of the philosophy of art mm. sort of way where you know you have your intention and then you have the manifestation of it as it winds up in reality and it's never the same sometimes i mean that's the beauty of it because sometimes the thing the unintentional thing is magical yeah, and uh, right. you can't get that weird uh, thing that happens without actually doing it and if it just all stays in your head right then uh you know then that 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 part of the you know it's like this goes from ideal to reality there's a there's a degeneration but there's also the chance for it to you know for it to spark something interesting and so you kind of there's there's these two things uh as when you do it original when it was done originally they kind of travel uh those those two things that, that you know the disappointment with how it came out versus mm. how you intended versus the you know the the thing that came out having a life of its own in and they 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 travel along with each other and uh you know you you go back and forth with how you and i there it was a uh it's a it's a weird psychological experience um you know you uh you relive the I don't know. This is too melodramatic to say you relive the pain. <laughs> yeah, like you yeah. relive the, the 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 angst of uh, you know everything that uh, that has to do with bringing forth a song mm -hmm. and a performance and a and a an artifact like a record is an artifact of it. And so you, but then you're you know much older, uh, looking back on it. So and that's a whole other level of of you know angst and yeah, yeah. so but yeah i i i'm a lot more philosophical in the other sense ab about these matters than i used to be uh i kind of have developed a sort of a historical <laughs> outlook on it like yeah. you know uh where because of because of i don't know if i would have um so firmly uh or so um convincing convincingly to myself arrived at that way of looking at it if i hadn't been the guy who was doing the archiving yeah, yeah right. but since i was and looking at it that way it's like this is you know for better or worse you try to make it sound as good as you can you try to present it as its best self is a way that i kind of looked at do at re, re uh, reconstituting these things but it's a part of history and for better or worse that's what happened there's some stuff that we did some stuff that i that i wrote and that we did that is uh quite good and uh you you can't get to that without the stuff that you built on that yeah. maybe wasn't all that great although a lot of people really love the stuff that isn't all that great so <laughs> yeah and at, at some point you keep going back and forth and round around on this and you just say look this is what it is and uh as it always was the if people appreciate it that's great um and it's great for me it's great for them uh and people who don't uh uh then fair enough but uh it it's uh, i i there was a time when i would listen to if i ever had occasion to listen to my old stuff i would just you know say ah hide my, hide my face for this is this is, turn it off turn it off i'm ugly uh and i i kind of grew out of that uh to a to a surprising extent to me. Is that mostly, it, it, when you say the cringe stuff, is that that mostly uh, cringe at things that you wrote? Like, why did I write, why did I use that line? Is it specific references or is it is it like, uh, I wish this song sounded, like I wish everybody else heard it the way that it sounded. It's a lot of, it's a, a lot of it is, a lot of it is sonic stuff because we never knew what we were doing yeah. and we never yeah. had very much, we didn't have, resources and you know we it always the case that it could have been better and then in some of the the situations where i was where we were more to to a larger degree uh in control of things and then you know this is like there were there were things that i wanted to do that i wasn't able to do for a variety of reasons and that just feels like this sort of disappointment um but then on the writing level you know for sure i there was a long time where like a lot of people 
a lot of bands, especially a lot of punk bands. I wasn't really, there was no reason to try that hard because it, you know, didn't seem to matter very much. And the bar was really low. Yeah. Uh, you know, you could, right. you could, you could, uh, you could really try hard and write the greatest song in the world, or you could not try at all. <laughs> and uh, it's an okay song and you get paid the same amount of beer and get the same, <laughs> like, you know, attention from uh, young ladies. And it's right. just all the, it's like, there, there, so there was a, there was, it was a, I didn't, I didn't realize that there was going to be some benefit in actually trying to write well till I'd already had all of these irrevocable things published. <laughs> right. And, you know, if I had known, if I could go back and tell the young Dr. Frank, you know, just try harder, you'll be you'll be much happier uh, when you're in your 50s yeah. <laughs> when you know if you if you spend a little more time making these lyrics rhyme and making them make sense and making them have a point uh, then you know I would do it obviously you can't do that um, so uh, so that's that's I mean the, and, and really that's the more important part um, the songs the another thing when you have a when you kind of have a zoomed out perspective on it all of the sonic stuff that you worry about the the, the drum sound or the the bass sound on this i don't like the way i w i wish we had done the guitars different um you know that ultimately kind of falls away it's the the rock and roll music is rock and roll and there's an ex there's an excitement about the fact that it's rock and roll but even on a level beyond that it's the material which is the songs and it stands or falls on that and mm. all of that rarefied uh detailed stuff is is interesting but it doesn't matter that much um and i have to say that all of that criticism self-criticism aside which there's plenty <laughs> of uh basis for yeah. uh on that level there's some there's some i have there's good songs there there's not only good but also uh not generic like not they justify their existence by the fact that you know for better or worse uh not no one else could have done them mm -hmm. and you know that's something because there's a lot and that's one of the reasons why people you know i'm always i'm grateful and a little bit surprised when i see evidence that people are still listening to this stuff that we recorded in the 90s and listening to it for fun you know a lot of bands that you can't a lot of a lot of bands that's not the case yeah right for. and it's 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 really boils down to uh the songs and whether they have a whether they can have a purchase on uh on your attention both sort of as music and sort of i don't know intellectually mm -hmm. uh on a on a very not probably not a, on a you know, it's always a little visceral when when you're talking about music but um and so uh i mean that's the reason why it's worth it even if you know this vocal sounds weird or you know this <laughs> this mix is screwy uh you know it's the it's the song it stands and falls on the uh on the basis of the songs some of that stuff that you'll be able to tweak uh in trying to remaster things and re-release them now and, yeah, and to you, try to get them to sound at least a little bit better maybe the playing yeah. isn't you're not going to re-record them because it's kind right. of right you there every time every recording involved and every phase of the recording involves all these decisions and some mm. of them are good and some of them are bad uh there and when you are re re doing some aspects of it you know you can you haven't you have another chance mastering is uh is it has a surprising um uh you can uh, you can get wildly different results depending on decisions you make in mastering even though the recording is set, yeah. uh you know and i one of the one of the so w my band was doing uh we released one of uh, the, uh, the most popular uh records of ours at the height of what's known as the loudness wars where everyone was trying to make their CDs louder yeah, than everybody else right. and compressing them so much to make that happen. And it would, that record really was uh, a victim of that. Uh, people like it. It's, 
it's a sound on its own and I know why people like the sound. Uh, however, it, you know, it's, there's an absence of dynamics that uh, when you hear it without or at least to, a de to the degree that you can, because our masters were actually also over compressed in that oh, area okay. as well. But but when you, but the more one of the things that you can, that if you hear the the greater dynamics, it's like you're hearing a different song. Yeah. yeah. And so then you have the how do we how what what uh, what is best to do with this? Um, it's a it's going to be that that record is Revenge is Sweet and So Are You. It's it's going to be when we get there. Um, uh, a matter of some, uh, you know, uh, soul searching to just to decide how far to go to restore uh, yeah, it right, uh, right. from, you know, because people like it, how yeah. it is. And, and, you know, I'm thinking, I'm sure if Chris Sacker were here, we'd say, oh, we'll do, you know, two versions and we'll do a set of a six LP set. There's no, <laughs> there's no, uh, we don't do all the outtakes. There, there's no, there's no uh, limit to the ambitions of uh, this guy, which is, which is <laughs> fun and great. I don't yeah. know that, I don't know that I think that'll happen, but so, uh, the, but the, then the other more, even more involved one is the, this, the, the choices that you make when you're mixing, which are even more choices and more things that uh, that go on. And I do think that some of these recordings to make them presentable do need, do need could really benefit from a remix and I do want to try it. But there you get to a whole other thing because you say, well, how can I, I can make this to, to a degree sound more like it was supposed to sound. Yeah, but yeah. then what do you, you know, are you gonna, is that gonna, is that like being George Lucas and inserting you know, uh, yeah, yeah, right. putting job of the hut in where he in a movie he wasn't in exactly. Yeah. So there, that's another that's another matter that uh, is uh, it's not straightforward what you do. We're spared that with Revenge is Sweet because the the, lar the there were seven there were at least seven multi track reels and only two survived. So uh, we're we a remix of that full album could never happen anyway. So. Yeah, uh, that simplifies that particular question. I'm pretty sure that the "Love Is Dead," our other popular record, uh, that uh, I'm probably the right decision to do of what to do with that is to just master the existing yeah. uh, two track masters as as well as we can. Because if there's anything that we've done that people care about, it's that. Um, but the other ones, I think there's a lot that you can do, but you could make your ch choices in doing that. You could, you know, have some uh, errors. Uh, and and even on the, even in mastering, you can make some weird decisions. And I remember when, when the CD of the Rolling Stones, the first CD of the Rolling Stones, Sticky Fingers came out. Mm. And I, I, that's a record that I know backwards and forwards. <laughs> yeah, I listened yeah. to it a million times since yeah. I was a kid. And so whatever this master was on this CD, they just added this reverb all over everything. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. think they were trying to make the drums sound like the 80s drums, which I hate. Right. <laughs> every yeah. every yeah. snare. And, uh, you know, it's, so that was a terrible choice. I'm, I assume they went back and, uh, and corrected that because it was just awful. Uh, I don't think that we're ever going to be in the position where that's a, a avenue we were, we <laughs> decided to go down, but it's that kind of thing that you got to be beware of because you can do more damage. You try to do your restoration, you can do more damage. So these are things that, that uh, it, this situation makes you think about. And I have been thinking about them, uh -huh. uh, you know, uh, but the, I mean, all that said, even the mixed, masters as they exist when you hear the the direct version of it it it, it sounds so different um already just from that that uh it i don't know i think i think the women who love them really if it's, you listen to that it sounds it not to make up, a dad joke but it sounds rad it sounds radical yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right right no it's it's like I, wow that there was it was it sounded okay before there i don't have criticism about how it sounded before but they what uh, the you know Justin did a very good job, and the whole thing was done very carefully, which you know it, it was 
things were always a little bit on a shoestring budget and kind of rushed in the, so but I you know I listened to it and it was like wow this is like a whole different record mm. and and that's the thing that's what you're going for you want right. the the existing thing but you want it to be you know like you want to find a a, a greater uh, level and a lower depth in it uh and it's cool when that happens yeah i could see i could see the tendency to want to leave an album like love is dead alone because that one like you said is so important to so many people and they hear it like i can hear that album start to finish right now without listening to it like it, it just, <laughs> yeah, it's been yeah. imprinted in my brain sort of like you with sticky fingers but i feel like an album like milk milk lemonade there's so much room to remix and play with things because that album yeah. could have been like this is obviously 27 years down the road but i feel like you can hear where that album could have gone it just like it, the music is all there the data is all there it's just a matter of sort of manipulating it yeah i feel the same way about that and that is you know that you'd have to you you know you have to so we'd have to find a uh, uh it was recorded on um, 16 track, one inch tape. Those mm. machines are very rare. Mm. It's it's very hard to find one in working order. Um, so that's that's all that that would be the challenge of that. But for yeah. both for those middle period, you know, the, the definitely milk milk lemonade, making things with light. We can make them sound so much better uh, if we had a chance. Um, but it's very com those those arrangements are complicated. There's, you know, there's a lot of, I don't even know, I've, I've, you know, it's been 1991 was when that was recorded. Wow. And uh, that would have been the last time I heard all the different <laughs> tracks of yeah, it. So yeah. who knows? But, uh, but that's, you know, that's the, that's the, the fun of it. Uh, if we ever manage to extract these tracks and, you know, do something with it, uh, uh, we'll find out, uh, we'll find out how it is. And, and the other thing is it's not, destructive so you know the old version's still there yeah, is, yeah you know a lot of them around kicking around it's on the internet so it's not like we'd be trying to disguise anything you can you know compare but you just have a you have a shot at you know it, it sort of bolstering it and, yeah. and doing a doing as good of a job as you can and that one could sound much bigger and uh yeah because it, it it's not a it's not a pop punk album, and I hate to, like a, a Ramones mm -hmm. core pop, which is sort of obviously what Lookout became sort of mm -hmm. known for, even though some of my favorite, like Avail was a Lookout band mm -hmm. and they are the furthest thing from a uh, Ramones core band. Yeah, but yeah. but that album in particular, that's that's more of like a Dinosaur Jr. sub pop album than a, than a Lookout yeah, record. Album. I know what you're saying. I, it's a, it is a, you know, it, it was when it came out, uh, Every, everyone was thrown for a loop, which was, you know, intentional. Although I was, you know, always, I always thought I, I want to, you know, throw a curveball and be surprising yeah. and everything. I, but it, I'm then having done that, I'm always surprised by the extreme nature of the reaction. And, uh, you know, it took, it took our fans a couple of years, a couple, two or three years to come to terms with it. And then it turned out to be a lot of people's favorite record. Uh, by that time, we'd moved on to doing other things. And there's all the same feel like I had the conversations of how ter how much of a betrayal it was to record that record. And then the same people, you know, thought the next one was a portrayal of that. And, yeah. uh, but it, it definitely was an unusual, it's a peculiar record in almost every way. I mean, that's what makes it, interest that's one of the things that makes it interesting it was uh where i was <clears throat> kind of trying but very much not quite there in controlling the writing mm. well enough but you know it led to some inadvertently interesting things i i mean it you know i would the the whole the, the tone of it and the theme it was a very very loose kind of unstated concept album uh about you know uh uh 
not being ready for maturity and uh, and yeah, confusion yeah. and that sort of thing. And you know, the fact that I was not not really knowing what I was doing with the writing created an example of the confusion that that the songs were trying to put across yeah, yeah, in a way right. that if you tried to do it on purpose, you probably wouldn't yeah, uh, right. be able to do, which is, I think, a very interesting thing. And I think there's that, that, that knowing that about it is a, that's something I didn't figure out until I started listening after the fact. And that's an example of the things that, you know, that was, I just, used to walk around if I'd ever think of it I would kind of cringing oh, that's, oh, how, that's, oh, what did I do there and then sort of realizing that there was something going on that was interesting that I didn't even know about uh, sort of having that uh, awareness you know to, takes you into a different uh, perspective on it mm. um, you know so it was a strange record very interesting it was the beginning of my trying to you know the, you know the harness the horses and drive them yeah, and yeah, right. sort of you know running off running into the ditch all over the place and <laughs> overturning the cart and everything but still you know I, I, I learned a lot and eventually was able to to write better and that that's how uh that's how that's how you learn uh and you know it's, it's a you have some missteps that are preserved for posterity unfortunately uh, but that's uh, the trajectory we it's, were on. It's a it's a metaphor for adolescence in and of itself, right? Like, exactly, like yeah, exactly right. You're exactly kind of right. like a like a newborn deer that's trying to figure out how to walk and <laughs> what, to, and then you finally put it all together. But yeah, right. So you can you got a trip and fall. Could, though. You could make a you could do a disquisition on this uh, trying to learn to walk and falling down that might take a with a lot of skill. You could get that. To work but then on the other hand you could just do it yeah like try to walk and fall down and that gets it across as well yeah. and that's what happened although there's interest you know it was with with some there's some sophistication in the in the arrangements and in the kind of the the conceptual stuff that uh also is there as well so i don't know when the time will come for doing that it's not one of the easy ones, oh, yeah, yeah. but it, I'm really interested to delve into it and see what's there. Cause you know, you, there's 16 tracks and you know, then you have more parts that are, uh, that are, uh, you know, dub, you know, you'll have, you'll have a bit that's on a part of one track and then you'll have a bit that's on it. So many different parts. And then all of the, you know, the various things you do, do to those tracks, when you're mixing them down and mm. all anybody knows about is those two uh stereo tracks and all i can remember is those two yeah, right. is what's on there so it could be i mean i'm sure there's stuff on there on the the actual tape that i don't even know about and you know that's very uh very interesting which one comes next do you have an order at least in your head that you're doing them in? um well you know that's the thing we we have we have a there's I do. I have a. I have a. I have a very ambitious plan for <laughs> love it. Doing something interesting with each of these records. Yeah. And one of the one of the challenges with our pandemic world is, it has, some of this stuff has to slow way down. Yeah. Um, because some of the things that um, I want to do are not for these releases are not that uh, feasible. Uh, the net. The. Uh, I mean, it, the next. Uh, Sounds Rad release is is going to be uh, uh, basically a B sides compilation. Oh, okay. Um, and but the next re uh, album reissue logically uh, should be Yesterday Rules because um, that never came out on vinyl either. But there are there's an unfinished song that I want to mix, and there's an unrecorded song that I want to record to augment it that was that was part of on the list of songs that and it's actually the, the song where the title yesterday rules comes from it's in the lyric and so my idea for that one is we'll uh you know record that song um and you know mix the unfinished one and have that be an extra disc or you know something of that sort um you know recording in this situation 
uh, is even more challenging than uh, it uh, otherwise would have been. So I don't know when that's going to happen. So it may be that we'll go for another uh, more easier one yeah. next. I just, I haven't, I'm still wrestling with this. Uh, there's, um, you know, the, uh, so uh, there's a Revenge is Sweet is limited uh, to what the uh, two track, because yeah. the multi-track isn't there, so we have that problem. That, that's one that would be relatively uh, straightforward. Show business is my life, my solo record. That's another one that the master tapes has dif have disappeared, but there was similar to, uh, you know, a uh, uh, similar situation where there was a safety copy of the DAT that found its oh, way okay. into a, a boot or whatever. So <laughs> that's another one that, that could be, it's still, still trying to chart this out. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're at about an hour. I don't want to take up too much of your afternoon. This is really cool. It has kind of flown by. So yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, same here. Well, uh, I got this much, this much <laughs> more to go. So, but you know, feel free to, to call it a, to call it a day whenever you, uh, whenever you like. There were, there were two questions. So when I posted on Instagram, one of them, uh, that I was going to be chatting with you, uh, there were a couple of questions that popped up and I'll go in okay. reverse order. Uh, okay. Well, one of them might be a long answer, and it's but but so and this is a little bit inside baseball, but it's the stuff that I nerd out about, so I kind of allow okay. it. But so somebody uh, you've posted about the um, the Les Paul Jr. that you've been, the old white one that you've been sort uh -huh. of restoring. Yeah. But then somebody said, well, what happened to the black Les Paul that he played like in the Milk Milk Lemonade years? Because it's been the coronet for years. It's been the white yeah. Les Paul before that. So they said, but I remember like. The old black Les Paul, like so. What yeah. happened to that one? Which again, I know is inside baseball. But hang on a sec. So <laughs> there it is. <laughs> it was hanging on the wall. Uh, I, you know, it's a, it's a. Um, this is probably uh, nineteen eighty. Uh, uh, you know, that's when they. Uh, they were making them very clunky yeah. and uh, that's got to weigh like 13 pounds. <laughs> yeah. Like really heavy. I mean, I did, you know, I, I did tours with it. I, that was, this is the guitar when we did our, our uh, tour of Europe. Um, that was our, the final tour of that lineup. Um, when after Milk of Lemonade came out, I like brought it to Europe and played night after night and probably, you know, permanently injured my <laughs> yeah, right, right from that. Uh, but you know, I've I've used it on on uh, on recordings and uh, and at shows on occasion since then. But it's uh, I don't. There's things I don't I don't. It's not my favorite version of the Gibson neck. I like the more the smaller, yeah. more humane kind that both that basically you know that the the kind of the the kind of. Uh, Gibson fretboard and and neck that was used in the sort of mid '60s at the Kalamazoo factory, which is the the uh, that I mean the 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 white Les Paul is uh, older than that, but it's basically that. It's very narrow at the end and yeah, it just that, feels more human. This one is so it's like a baseball bat. It's for a neck. so wide yeah. and flat, and yeah. it's just like very um, uh, uh, you know maybe just too big for me yeah, and, yeah. and uh you know but i i like it and why i'm i'm glad i have a black Les paul it's cool it's something i one of those things where when i because of uh because of being when i was a kid you know i liked keith richard and i liked mick jones and i liked the sex pistols and they all were playing these les paul the big heavy and yeah. everything that i always wanted so when i had it found myself with a little bit of money um and had you know saw one that i could get uh i'm sure you'd have to pay a lot more. i think it was 800 bucks back in the in the uh in the uh, early 90s or late yeah. 80s when i got it it'd be a lot more now but you know it's something i always wanted i love the way it looks yeah uh but yeah i i much prefer the uh much for the other the other variety yeah what got you into the coronet that's such a cool guitar, um, but few people yeah, played them. Yeah, it's so I was introduced to it by a guy, Kent Stedman, who uh, was the 
great guitar player. He was in, in he's an Australian band called the Celibate Rifles and a great band. Uh, we, we were, they kind of helped us out a lot when we were a stupid young band and they were <laughs> yeah. in the, in the, you know, mid to late eighties, they were one of these, you know, bands that were just constantly, they did, you know, a tour of like, that took four years of just going around the, the world and uh, they got us our first gig at a real club. Um, we're opening for them and it's cause they, you know, they heard our stupid little record of Danny, <laughs> pa oh, Danny Patridge. Yeah, 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 these yeah. guys that get yeah, these guys that play Danny Patridge. Uh, and uh, so I became, uh, I got to know him and became close friends when he played uh, Epiphone Cornet. And it just kept telling me you know, that I had to get one. Yet every time I talked to him, and I took his advice, and uh, when I had a chance to to get one, I I got it, and I have I got one every time. Every time I saw one, I have a I have a few of them now. Oh, okay. And uh, they're yeah, they're great. I mean, I can't do what he did with them with it, but it's uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's great. And just for how uh light it is and how yeah. insubstantial it is it's so solid it's like it, it never goes out of tune it never it's it's all completely reliable and something about the there's a that the the p90 with the chrome plated yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. cover has this sound that is unlike any other it's a it's a it, it you can't and then you know so I, I think I'll try to experiment with using other guitars and I always come back to that because it's so reliable and sounds so much better than anything else so uh, yeah I I love it and that particular one the main one I play is they're all everyone is a little bit different and that one is the best sounding one that I, of of all of them even though it's got a bit of a it's a bit beat up but I love it, it. the pictures you've posted on it the close-ups like of the bridge that thing i think you even said it looks like a barn door that's exactly yeah, it right. is. It's like that's the way they it. Pitting and all this <laughs> yeah. stuff and i have one well, i have one that's a, a dwight uh uh edition which is the the they made uh an edition of the mid-60s coronets for this uh dwight music store in I don't even know, is it like Pittsburgh or I can't remember oh, okay. anyway. It says it has a little plate that says Dwight on it and it is perfect. Like it's the <laughs> finish is just it's like yeah, it's yeah. never been out of the case. Yeah. It's so gorgeous, but it just doesn't sound as good. I don't know why. It's just you know, there's some of there's something about it's too perfect. Uh, that particular one. Yeah, maybe. So yeah. maybe, you know, I I will wait a little while till guitars get even vintage guitars getting even crazier <laughs> and then right. I'll sell it so I can send my imaginary kids to school um uh and uh but until then it's just remaining in the case uh thanks for doing this this is this is a lot yeah. of fun um this yeah i mr t experience are responsible for a lot of the reason i got into punk rock music back in the mid 90s and uh i still have very fond memories i think my first mr t experience show was queers the groovy ghoulies and screw 32 at the middle east in cambridge wow 32 yeah that's uh, that, yeah that's going back at ways well, my we memory had, yeah, says there's... screw 32 was on that bill but that's why i wrote it in my notebook so uh-huh yeah but, we, we yeah the, there were some we did so many so many shows in those days that yeah. you know, it's hard <laughs> to remember them individually but you know there was never a never never a bad it's never a bad time when you play with the queers yeah that like right up to this day right um so uh that that, that would have been a good one as as a somebody who was born and raised in new hampshire we don't have very much we can hang our musical <laughs> history hats on we have right. Gigi allen was born in new hampshire and yeah. honey james dio was born in new hampshire and the queers uh, <laughs> yeah i if i it, if i'd ever heard that about dio I had forgotten it, so now he was born um, in Portsmouth, uh, New Hampshire. Yeah, oddly enough. Huh. How about that? Yeah, I, I, listen, we don't have much history, so I have to know those things. <laughs> oh, there's quite a bit of history in the. I don't know what is it like. It's one of the original uh, thirteen states. There's a, music history. Yeah, well, so, well, rock yeah. music history. We don't have 
I used to, I I used to, you know, when Joe lived in that weird big house in uh, Portsmouth and found ourselves staying there, you know, uh, many times, um, those were, those were great. That was the, 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 the Joe King of that era was a, was a, you know, he had his restaurant and he had his, he was, he 